What's up guys, welcome back. We are going to dive into the Stimulus JavaScript framework this episode. I'm gonna give you an introduction and show you how it compares to other JavaScript frameworks and libraries. And then we'll dive into taking a look at some examples. But then in a future episode, we'll dive into some more complex stuff. This is just your primer, your introduction. We're going to take a look at all of that um, in this episode. So where does stimulus fit in and why do we need another JavaScript framework? And why are you calling it a framework in quotes? Well, uh, stimulus is very different from what you might expect. So when you think of a JavaScript framework these days, you think of something that helps you rendering HTML, handling events, worrying about your state, doing all kinds of other things like subcomponents and organizing all your code and all that stuff. Well, it's not really what stimulus does. It does some of that, but it's designed mostly to just handle events in an organized manner. And so we have to first take a look at where Basecamp has come and their approach on JavaScript on the front end. And so we'll jump back to Turbolinks real quick and talk about Turbolinks and why it exists. Well, there was a time when everybody was talking about how fast it was to build your front end on uh, in JavaScript and render out all the HTML, and that was way faster than browsers being sent a GET request, having to reload all your JavaScript and CSS, and making those pages slow just because the browser would clear out all of that on the next request. And so Turbolinks was introduced to give you the speed of a single page app without any of the complexity. So all it does is listen to link clicks and says, well, instead of doing that with the regular browser process, let's just do that with Ajax. Let's replace the DOM with a new DOM and rerun your JavaScript as necessary. And that is that. And so that worked out really nicely um, in a lot of cases, but it didn't address the entire problem that f other front end frameworks and single page app frameworks did. So those took care of helping you render HTML. They took care of the state. They did a lot of extra stuff. And so that is where Turbolinks fell flat. It only made new page requests quick, but you were still required to use something like vanilla JavaScript or jQuery to handle events to build out complex forms or wizards or anything like that that might be interactable on a page. And so stimulus is being introduced as an alternative to doing your front end framework as a heavy framework again. And you don't have to go through and come up with your own structure for vanilla JavaScript. You don't have to use jQuery either. And so this is designed more as a competitor to jQuery than it is a competitor to Ember or Angular or React or Vue. Or Vue. So those are all still fairly heavy front end things and Stimulus and Turbolinks are designed to do one thing and do it one thing really well and they kind of fit really well together because they don't step on each other's toes or anything like that. They do very separate things. And so Stimulus um, is mostly designed to help take events that happen on your HTML and then run some JavaScript. And basically you just define data attributes and where jQuery you might have said, well, we need to look up this element. If it's on the page, then we need to uh, connect this event listener and all of that. Those things are taken care of for you in stimulus. And all you do is write some data attributes like data controller and data target and data action. And those will be wired up for you. And all you have to do is implement the equivalent methods inside of your controller to make those uh, functions work. And so this is kind of like building out your jQuery events in a much more structured way. And so you're unlikely to get as much spaghetti JavaScript code as you might where you accidentally do things in jQuery and don't structure them correctly. Um, so this is very much a competitor to jQuery more than it is with Vue or Angular, or React, or Ember. And uh, that's something important to keep in mind because I think a lot of people read this and they're like, does it do Ajax requests for me? Does it handle state? Does it render HTML? No, pretty much none of that. It just really focuses on events because you also have Rails UJS to do your Ajax requests. That's built in. You have Turbolinks to make your page um, render uh, the new content or whatever. And so Stimulus is just designed to say, well, we have this HTML and we want to make it interactable. How do we do that? 
And so that is where stimulus fits in. So let's dive into an example application and let's generate a new app. We're gonna use Webpacker to install stimulus. So let's just call this app stimulating and uh, we'll do dash dash Webpack in order to set up Webpack. You can always go to the Webpacker installation instructions and add Webpacker to an old application if that's what you would like to do. Um, this will just go ahead and install it automatically for us. Um, so we don't have to worry about that. So once this is set up, we can then go and create our uh, stimulus setup code inside of our JavaScript pack tag um, and all of that. So we'll get stimulus set up and then we'll be able to use that anywhere in our application. So if we go into the stimulating app, we can yarn add stimulus. That's going to install the NPM package for us. And then we can open up our application here we're going to need to go and do one thing first. We're going to go to the application HTML ERB. We will grab this JavaScript include tag and change it to a pack tag. So that will load our app JavaScript packs application.js. Now we don't need any of this in here really, um, but we do need to set up our initializing, initializer code for stimulus. So let's take a look at that. Uh, we need to import application from stimulus. Then we need to import auto load uh, from stimulus webpack helpers. This is gonna help us auto load all of our controllers um, and that will save us a lot of time. And then we'll have application uh, dot start and then const controllers is going to be require dot context dot slash controllers true and then we're looking for anything that ends with uh, dot js and then auto load uh, controllers for this application um, and so what that's going to do is require us to have a app javascript packs controllers folder you could also do dot dot slash controllers if you wanted app javascript controllers but we're going to do that just in the standard folder so we'll have controllers here um and that folder will show up in a second once we add let's add a file in there so javascript packs controllers um and let's do uh hello controller.js so you need to name it with the same name and underscore like you would with rails and then underscore controller.js at the end so this is very similar to how you do a controller file name in rails and then the difference um, once you create one of those is that you are going to create a class here um, and export that so here first we need to import controller from stimulus and then we can export default uh, class extends controller. So I have an unnamed class uh, that it inherits from controller and then we're gonna export this so that when the auto load loads it, it will be able to get this class and use access to that somewhere else. Um, and in here we can do all of our actions that we would like. So we don't have any pages in our Rails app yet, so let's go create one. Let's generate a scaffold for event um, with names. And let's leave it at that for now and we'll go back in another episode and do some more complex stuff with stimulus. So with this done, well, let's run Rails DB migrate. Let's go to our Rails app and go to the routes file and set root to events index. Save that and let's go to the events controller or the events index.html.erb. And in here is where we can begin by adding our stimulus stuff. So let's just create a new tag here at the bottom of data controller equals hello. Let's have a div or a, let's do the input example as before. So we have data target. This is how you can say I want to reference this later on in my JavaScript, so we'll add data target on it so we can easily pull that up. And you might think that you could just type name here like you would probably do um, on your own, but you actually need to namespace this under the controller name 
uh, for it to work properly. And so keep that in mind, um, but that's going to help in case you mix these in with other ones. You'll know that this is the hello, or this is the name for the hello controller, and you might have HTML mixed in with another component that has a name as well, and so that way it doesn't get confused. So we'll say type equals text here, finish that up, and we'll add a button with a special data action. Um, and let's call this one, when we do a click event, we want to call the hello controllers log method. And so we'll log this out um, into the console. And this one's syntax is very simple. You have the event name, similar to all the event names that you would listen to like on submit or on click or on paste or key up, any of those things you can do. Um, and then you can tell it with the arrow, call this controller and this action. So we're gonna have methods in here that will match those action names. And so then from here, you have access to a special variable called this.targets. That is coming from your controller, which will allow you to grab those targets. And you can say find name, and that will look for anything called hello.name um, and grab that first one. And then we can ask for the value on that. We can say console.log, that out. And so if we refresh our page, um, we should be able to see this and we should be able to say test one, two, three, click log, and that will print that out. So that worked well, but I want to point out that this works for all events. By default, click is kind of the most common one. A lot of times we'd use that. But if you had a form here, you could actually apply this stuff to a Rails form and you could have a data action submit. And you could have it call some JavaScript in your controller when the submit was attempted. And so you could check for validations then, and you could cancel the submit if you wanted to. You can do all that kind of stuff. And I'm gonna show you how you can interact with the event when you submit something. So for example, um, instead, we don't have a form here. Instead, let's create a data action on the input element. Let's say, well, when you paste into this in input element, we'll call the hello paste method. And our paste method is just gonna be one of those annoying ones that says um, event.preventDefault, uh, we, where we don't want the paste to work. And that will happen because we can receive the event as an argument to our action here. So for all of these, if you ever wanna interact with that, just type event here or E, and that will make sure that you get access to that. Um, otherwise, it just sends it anyways, but you ignore it and don't send it, save it to a variable. So you can always add that in and then call prevent default if you want it to intercept and cancel that from happening. And then for here, we could just say console.log, pastes are not allowed. And so if we grab some text here, copy it to the clipboard, and we refresh our browser, um, we should be able to paste that in and it will say paste or not allowed and it didn't actually put the text into the box either because the prevent default uh, stopped it from doing that. So that's cool, that's how you could add this to your forms and then go check all of those uh, data targets and say is this, does this match, um, you know, is this filled out or not, yes or no, does this match the regex that I wanted to match or whatever, all those kind of validations you can do really easily with something like this, which is really cool. And last but not least, we wanna talk about state in these uh, components because they're very different than the state that you might think of in React or Vue where you have a JSON object doing that. In Stimulus, they encourage you to use HTML attributes to do that. So for example, if you wanted to pass in a uh, default value for the name, you would do something like data hello name equals say Chris. And here we would be able to access, uh, we get, get name, we create an attribute uh, accessor to get the name. And so this would be um, this dot data, and that's going to use our controller wrapper tag. So this is going to look for the data attribute on there. And here we can say get name, but really we want to say if this dot data dot has name, they have a few helpers here so we can check to see if there is one defined. Otherwise, we will use maybe a return 
default user. And so we can return this value on there. And so we'll either get the default name or not. And we can define an initialize method here. And this is going to allow us to say this dot, um, and we need to reference that name input element. So let's take this and make it a getter as well. So we'll have name element as our getter, name element. That way we can reuse that in a couple places and we'll have return on there and we can use name element there. We'll have this dot name element <clears throat> um, dot value equals this dot name. So that's going to set the default value when we load our page. So loading our page, we see that we get Chris as the default value in our log box. We can click um, log, but that's not going to work anymore because we need to use this dot name dot element to access the getter. And then um, if we go and remove the default value there, we can refresh this page um, and it's going to say default user instead and logging should work now. Um, if we type Chris in there, we can type law or hit log and that will default or that will print out the value that's currently in there. So all of this is kind of designed so that your HTML is what keeps track of the state and you're going to use that as a place that you can have so that when TurboLinks reloads the cached version of the page, the stuff will continue to work. You're not making extra Ajax requests just to fill out the form because Rails can go ahead and add that data attribute in with JSON or text or whatever values you need and then your page can immediately be functional as soon as it gets rendered in your browser. That way you're not making these extra Ajax requests that make certain widgets of your page load after the page is loaded, which gets kind of frustrating. So this takes a an angle at things that's different than your JavaScript frameworks than you're used to. And I really like this for simple stuff. I'm very curious what happens as you go and build more complex things with this. I think it will work out pretty well, um, but I haven't built anything super complicated with it yet. And so that is what we're gonna be diving into more in the next few weeks as I learn this some more and we get to see what other people are building with it. I think it'll work out pretty well and the simplicity of this goes hand in hand with the simplicity of Rails. If you know how Rails controllers and routes work, this all feels very similar to how um, those work at just in JavaScript land instead. So it's really cool. The one thing that I keep forgetting is these um, namespaces on the targets and the data attributes. I always kind of forget that they need to have the namespace of the controller in there, um, but so far that's not really that bad. So that is it for this episode. I hope that helped you wrap your head around stimulus and where it fits in and what it's good at and what it's not good at. And hopefully that will make it um, easier for you to decide if you want to use stimulus or not in the future. So if you have any questions, as always, let me know in the comments below and I'll do my best to help answer those and get you a better understanding of Stimulus.js. Till next episode, I'll talk to you later. Peace.